Hi there, come on in. It's Thursday night, April 19th, the year 2001. Do you know that Michigan has a sturgeon season open right now? It's in one lake. I'll explain to you what that lake is and what the regulations are. We will look at sturgeon in the rivers like they do in the spring going into spawn and the sturgeon propagation program by the DNR and a lot more. So you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. Those little teeny There's candy. a lamprey there. Two oh. lampreys on that one. Three lampreys. You look at that 11 inch lamprey in the back. There's a little four inch underneath it. Jurassic Park lives in Michigan. It lives and moves in a couple of streams in the northern part of the state. I'm talking about the prehistoric fish known as the sturgeon. It was around when we had mastodons and dinosaurs, but it evolved very little over time. These fish grow to six or even eight feet long. They attract a crowd of DNR fisheries employees each year who net the spawning monsters to get eggs which are hatched out at the Wolf Lake Hatchery. Now without the help from the DNR, the natural reproduction in our northern streams would not sustain the species like it has over the centuries. In the spring, when they're spawning, they're easy to approach. They're sort of like manatees in that they don't have any natural enemies except poachers. With their large size, they don't have to be afraid of any natural predators that live in Michigan. Sturgeon produces a delicacy, at least to some people. It's called caviar. These are the eggs where baby sturgeon come from. These eggs will go back to the hatchery for incubation. Now, the footage that you're looking at was videotaped in the early 1980s by Clarence Archambault from Black Lake. He was a pioneer in outdoor home videos. And fortunately, the quality of home video equipment has come a long ways in the past 12 years. Back in the 80s, that was astounding footage that Clarence Archambault got with his, his old VHS camera. But since, since then, we've had a lot of advancements in cameras, a Hi8 camera here. In fact, this one belongs to a fellow we call, and who looks like he might be, a professor of fishology. Professor Fins, we call him. His name is Gary Craig, actually. And you're from Portland. Been fishing all your life. 50 years. And teaching fishing. 30 years. 30 years of fishing classes, and now you've added a, a new element, videography of unusual fishing subjects. You started off with some, with some uh, we have uh, some tape here. In fact, why don't we roll into the tape right now? What have we here? We have a one month old three to four inch sturgeon, uh, a little five gallon aquarium at the Wolf Lake Hatchery, northwest of Kalamazoo. In preparation for my first sturgeon excursion, I wanted to start with some smaller ones and learn a little mm -hmm. bit about them. Well, this is, uh, they hatch these out at the hatchery That's because right. they don't get good enough reproduction in, in That's the right. streams these up there. These are actually from Wisconsin eggs. Michigan and Wisconsin have been trading off every other year for a few years and uh, taking eggs mm -hmm. and then sharing them with the other state. And they grow them by the scabillions down That's there. right. That's but right. I don't imagine a whole lot of these survive. No, the mortality rate is about 99% probably. Here they are at three months and seven inches. The one in the center, just going to the mm -hmm. left, is a double nose, which is uh, an oddity of nature that only occurs maybe once every 60, 80,000 fish. Huh. Of course, that's a deformity that's right. of that's the sturgeon. Right. But otherwise, the sturgeon look identical. One looks exactly like another, and they, and they look like the adults. When they're, when they're small, they actually have more definition at a couple, three months than they do when they get, when they get older. And as they get older, their nose start to get uh, more blunt. Of course, these fish don't mature, Fred, until 25, 30 years of age. Wow. At about four foot, four and a half foot long. And we are talking about a prehistoric species That's here, right. sort of a Jurassic Park of species. A species that's world. been around for 30 million years. Well, this particular one is down the road from the Wolf Lake Hatchery a little ways at DNR Sports, who have a thousand gallon aquarium. And they have two, uh, four or five year old sturgeon, about 22 inches, probably three and a half pounds. That's now, what we're watching here. Now, they're supposed to have four barbels hanging from under the nose, aren't they? It looks like his left one on our right uh, was, was lost, maybe mm. by that eight-pound bass that's in mm. the tank. So those barbels, of course, they feed on the bottom with that, that mouth, that vacuum cleaner type right. mouth. That, so normally, we're looking at them as they're swimming around freely in an aquarium. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the wild, in their native waters, don't they spend most of their time just cruising over the bottom? That's right, Fred. Their bottom feeder is looking for uh, crayfish and uh, other small crustaceans, once in a while a dead minnow or something like that, or a frog. They use the feelers to feel to decide if they want to taste it or not. If they do, they protract their mouth, which is kind of like a vacuum cleaner hose type of thing on a large fish that mm. can be eight inches long and eight inches in diameter. And the, the taste buds surround that protracted mouth and lips that come down. 
So, but they don't have teeth. No, no teeth at all. And their skin is more like leather. Nine. Like leather, yeah. Indians used to use it for drums, teepees, even hmm. uh, canoes. Now these fish 70, right here, like the ones that, that Clarence videotaped, uh, how big are they? Uh, fish we're looking at right there is probably 90 pounds, uh, five foot long. If you look closely, you'll see a, a, a little uh, stream lamprey. Uh, On, yeah. These fish are both the 75 pound range, four and a half to five feet. Hmm. Probably uh, 50 year olds. Now, this is in, what, the first part of May, early May? That's right. That's when they come into the streams to spawn. Usually the first, uh, second, middle two weeks of May. Uh, water temperature needs to be about 51 and a half degrees. With enough solar energy to expand the iris in their eyes. It's a combination of those two things, basically a water temperature and how much solar activity there's been lately. Now, they, they, otherwise they would not be in these streams. That's right. And people wouldn't see them in the lakes. That's right. Because they would be down how deep? The bottom. Uh, the bottom. Mullet the Lake, that might be 150 feet deep. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard stories, rumors over the years of huge sturgeon in Higgins Lake at 200 foot depths. Mm -hmm. uh, Black Lake is typically 20 to 30 feet deep, and, uh, but Mullet Lake does have some 150 foot water. Now this is, appears to be underwater footage. That's right. I uh, played around. Uh, I looked for a, one of the Lexon uh, plexiglass underwater cameras like Jacques Cousteau uh, <laughs> has, and to find out it costs more than a camera. And yeah. uh, so I have a, uh, a Rubbermaid uh, underwater camera well, yeah, apparatus well, that costs $15 to make instead of 2000 Take a look at that when we get done with this tape. Now this is on a, on a day that I would guess it's a cloudy day. Oh, what is that thing doing there? Well, Does that have anything to do with releasing the eggs or anything? It really doesn't. What that fish was doing is the same thing that salmon and steelhead and bass do. <clears throat> They're hydraulically creating that pull to lift the rocks off the bottom and turn them over because the rocks have moss on them. And when they're mossy and, and slippery like that, the eggs will not adhere to those rocks. Mm. So what they're doing is hydraulically pulling and moving that bottom around, rolling the stones over. That's why when you see bass and salmon beds and things like that, mm -hmm. that they're lighter colored. And that's what the female doing is rolling the rocks over so that the eggs can adhere to the rock. Well, now these fish, there's there's like They're a whole herd food. of them there, uh, or herd. flock, or covey. I call it a sturgy. Yeah, because it wouldn't really be a school in that sense. They only do this for the at the breeding time. Right, just for a day or two. And uh, they'll lay their eggs right there. Right, right there. Right Those there. little teeny. There's cat a lamprey here. there. Two oh. lampreys on that one. Three lampreys. You look, look at that 11 inch lamprey in the back. There's a little four inch underneath it. Huh. And then up ahead, about a foot, there's another five-inch lamprey. Now, is that the sea lamprey? No, these are stream lampreys. They're not even the, what you'd call the Great Lakes lamprey. These are little stream lampreys. Uh, the maximum size they get is about the size of the big one. And those stream lampreys have been in the streams for? We've had that for a long time. As far as I can remember, 50 years ago, trout fishing just up even around Clary Mount Pleasant, they were in the streams then, usually hmm. three to six inches. Lampreys are probably... You uh, see some lamprey scars on some of these fish. So they don't, they don't really... Uh, cause any mortality or anything in the sturgeon? Probably, probably not a, a lot on the larger fish. The smaller ones, they probably do. Now, you know, as people look at this, they see how close you are to these fish. You can just walk amongst these fish? There's that a good lamprey mark right there. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right, Fred, and that's why they're so susceptible to poachers. Uh, it's been a problem up there forever, and uh, these fish are, are so tame, it's almost like a little petting zoo. You can actually step right in the water and caress these fish, and they'll two of them will lay right between your legs if you want them to. And They're very, very trusting and vulnerable. Yeah, with a 7,500-pound fish like that that has some good meat on it, I mean, if, oh, yeah. if it's eaten fresh, but the poachers could get in there and take them, well, they probably couldn't take them by hand because they're strong fish, but they yeah. spear them, snare them, shoot them, net them, shoot yeah. them. Oh, yeah. Now that's, uh, and of course the DNR has to keep a tight patrol on that when these fish are in the streams. Well, that's right. They do a good job of that, but there just isn't enough COs out there. Uh, I, for one, would like to see more COs protecting our fishing game. Now, have you ever fished for sturgeon yourself? I have not, Fred. I, uh, I promised myself to uh, this year about the only place there's a really a decent fishery uh, because there's no season on inland lakes is in Lake St. Clair. Mm -hmm. And you'd probably have about a, a one in a million chance of catching a sturgeon. There, there used to be a couple guides that worked out in the Detroit yeah, area that used to go out to the old dumping grounds yeah, in the Lake St. Clair uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago and actually take people there to sturgeon fish. And they'd use six night crawlers or uh, half a pound of chicken liver or a, or a stunk of side pork or bacon or something like this for, uh, for bait.
and lay it on the bottom. Right. But there's not, there are people who catch sturgeon by hook and line that is normally just by accident. That's right, that's right. Now the Rubbermaid that Gary was just talking about, this is it. This is the, the lens you're looking at, and it's absolutely a Rubbermaid dual action. It says <laughs> dual action trash can, and you put your camera down in here? That's right, just have a little tripod mount in there. Goes in. Set the camera. Works just fine. And, and walk down underneath the water. That's right. The, just this corner has to be under the water, and it takes away the, the uh, tension on the water and the surface reflection, and re just like wearing a snorkel mask. Hmm. Is this the only thing you've ever invented for fishing, Professor Fins? Oh, I've, I've tried a few other things, yes. <laughs> many, many other things. Well, Gary? But one thing Professor Fins does not have from personal experience is a trophy tale about sturgeon. <laughs> name is Ken? Uh, Ken Grazak. Grazak, that's how you pronounce that, from Hudsonville. Hudsonville, correct. 90 inches. 90 inches long. Seven and a half feet, that is. Estimated at 200 pounds or better. Fish, now, fish was approximately 100 years old. Man. Slow growers. Now, were you fishing actually for sturgeon? Yeah, we were fishing for sturgeon actually. Uh, I had one day to go while I was up to it with my wife, and it was my wedding anniversary, August 1st, and I left her at the motel and took the car and but that was my, my present, I guess. <laughs> you guess? Yeah. And okay. uh, it was opening day for steelhead fishing over there, and mm -hmm. the two guys I was with wanted to go steelhead fishing in the worst way, and I said, hey, I don't live here. I only got one chance to catch a sturgeon, and I wanted to fish for sturgeon, so. So, so what do you catch it on? Well, Big hooks, little hooks? Uh, we're using, the law there requires you use barbless hooks, and uh, we used uh, smelt, uh, mm -hmm. ocean smelt for bait, and we're using sinkers the size of tennis balls. The current was really mm. unreal. So you couldn't throw out very far. But anyways, I had this bite and I set the hook and this fish came straight out of the water like a no. ship to shore missile, just straight out. Now I seen All you, the way out? All the way out. Now I seen you on TV with buck fever, but it can't compare. With sturgeon fever. The sturgeon fever, you know. A I just yelled. Seven and a half foot fish yelled, torpedoing well, the out The fish the came out of the water completely three times while I was fighting it. And you wouldn't think a sturgeon I that know. size would do that. I, they do, though. And uh, I yelled fish on, and immediately they got the captain of the boat or the guy that was running the boat. They have uh, a, a big ball, like a balloon, on the end of their anchor rope, and a quick-release anchor, and they threw it in. And we were going down river with the fish because he was spooling me real fast. I mean, if you can see the rod I had on there, it's just a little number nine, ten reel. Oh, uh, you know, just that's a, a little teeny rod. Yeah, just a regular. So the boat was was a major factor in, in uh, landing in, this in fish. Landing and, the he, fish. and it was it was a jet boat and uh, I think the fish was scared by the boat. Whenever it would go in an area where we didn't want it to go, he would swing around, get ahead of it, and gun the engine and, and the fish would turn. Hmm. So about two and a half hours later after we fought it in two it went into Washington. Two and a half yeah. hours it of fighting. It went into this? Washington and then back into Oregon and because we we're you know back into Washington. Finally we got it on the on the Oregon side. Now, where'd you have your license for? Uh, it was for Oregon, but it was good in, in the whole river. So we took these pictures and uh, <laughs> released it. Released the fish. Yeah, maybe it'll live another 100 years. Man, a 100-year-old fish. Now, why, why did you release it? Uh, well, the law there requires that it was oversized for keeping. You can okay, only keep so them. They have a slot, I think it's between 40 and 60 inches you that can you keep can those. keep those. But that's these why you are, have these to are use barbless hooks. Okay, and these are so much rarer because they're the breeders and yes, the spawners. Yes, that's, that's a white, uh, a white sturgeon also. Wow. So it's a very interesting. Uh, I never, I, I caught that fish. I got in the boat. I said, "That's Miller time." You know, I sat down, mm -hmm. opened the beer. I didn't fish the rest of the day. I said, "Anything I catch after this is." going to take I, away from this. I bet, I bet on your anniversary, your wife, when you came home with beer on your breath, was just so <laughs> glad to see you. She was. She says, what She says, what'd you catch? And I told her, you know, well, the terrific. story of what I caught. And uh, she, uh, she really enjoyed that. And we enjoyed that trophy tale about the sturgeon from Oregon. Or was it from Washington? Well, the sturgeon is a fish that's a thrill to land no matter where you catch it. No, this is not a sturgeon I caught, but it's one that we have on display here at the museum. Ed, this is Ed Polidor's sturgeon. His wife, I guess, really didn't appreciate it having, having it hanging in the house, so uh, he brought it to the museum to put on display. And this is a big one. When can you catch sturgeon in Michigan? Well, here's the scoop if you look in the fishing guide.
Most of the waters of Michigan are open to hook and line fishing, catch and release only. You can't possess the sturgeon. That's from July 16th to March 31st. Now there are four bodies of water where you can catch and keep if you're lucky enough. Uh, one of those is Otsego Lake. No closed season. Uh, there's one fish per season allowed and a 42 inch minimum. Now on Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River, that's open from July 16th to September 30th, and the fish have to be between 42 and 50 inches. Anything smaller or larger must go back, again, one per season. Then there's a special lottery drawing for Black Lake in Sheboygan County. Only five sturgeon per season are allowed to be taken by all anglers total. Uh, a very limited, very short season, spearing only. Well, your chances of catching and keeping one of these babies from Michigan waters is rather small, but at least you can fish for them. And now, if you want a recipe, not for sturgeon, but for Great Lakes fish, listen to this one. 